and you're about to watch a video of a message that was preached at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, our mission is to help people take their next step with God, and we pray this message helps you do just that. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. Um, you guys happy to be here? <laughs> Who's here for the 1130 service? Anybody here? Yeah, this guy right here. Me too. I'm here for the... No, um, I'm actually like super jet lag. I just spent 10 days in California, um, and it was awesome. In the West Coast, I actually had the privilege of speaking at a men's conference in New Mexico for two days. Over 450 men just worshiping God and, and just trying to get closer to God and fix things in their life, and it was awesome. Um, I was also able to speak at a church in Riverside, California um, on, on uh, Sunday, and so it was awesome, and God did some cool things there too. And then the best part of the vacation is on Sunday afternoon, my wife met me in uh, Los Angeles. She flew out there, and we spent the rest of the week there to celebrate 13 years of marriage. Um, and so that's awesome. And I'm going to do a quick little slideshow with you. This is us riding bike to Venice Beach. And then this is us. Uh, my kids saw this, and they're like, you went to Disney without us? And so this is not uh, in Disney Studios. This is actually the real Man's Chinese Theater. Next. This is us, and that's the Hollywood sign, that little white thing in the back. And so it was like 45 minutes on this hike, and I'm like, babe, let's just take the picture because we're never going to get there, right? And so we took the picture next, and then, and that's the last day. This is my favorite picture, um, uh, and that's my wife there. She loves nature, and it just, like, looked perfect, and I'm like, don't move. Let me take this picture, and I'm trying to win an award with this picture, but no, just kidding. Uh, so it was a, a great, great trip, and um, it's the first time that we've left our three kids for, like, more than, like, two or three days, and that was awesome. I want to do it again, like, this week. So, uh, no, but, but let me tell you something. It was a great trip, but something happened to me on the second day of my trip that was horrible. I mean, it was pretty bad, um, and here's what happened. Um, uh, so I got to New Mexico Friday. I, I preached this message. I actually talked twice that day. Um, like right off the plane, they tried to show me like all of Albuquerque in one day. In an hour, my lips were chapped because there's like no humidity there. So um, we went to the top of a mountain and then we went to like shoot shotguns in the middle of the desert all in like 30 minute time. Okay, um, so that was great. And then I went from the desert in a shotgun to a stage to talk to men, to my hotel, back to, to the place, talked again. Then they wanted to take me to this place by the university to eat. They thought it was awesome. I thought it was okay. Um, and then I was tired. I was just, like, really tired, jet lagged, woke up at 3 a.m. Eastern. So it was like if I would have woken up at 1 a.m. over there. And so I was tired, and I go to sleep. And then because of the no humidity, I couldn't sleep, and I was waking up, like, every 30 minutes coughing. I drank, like, three bottles of water throughout the night. Um, and so 4.30, I gave up. I'm like, you know what? Maybe God wants me to, like, review my message, right? And so I go to, my, to look for my bag, and um, as I get close to my bag. I'm looking in my bag and I'm like, my laptop is missing. Someone broke into my room in the middle of the night and stole my laptop. All right, I'm freaking out. I can't find that. I'm like, you know what? No, no. I was charging it the night before. I probably left it at home. My wife is going to meet me on Sunday in Los Angeles. She'll just bring it. Right. And so I had to wait because it's like, you know, 5 a.m. and over over here. And and so I wait till it's like about 7, and I call her, and I'm like, hey, babe, you know, I think yesterday I left. It was 3 a.m. It was early. I left my laptop charging, and she's like, oh, I'll look for it. Calls me back 10 minutes later, babe, your laptop's not here. Nowhere to be found in the house. And I'm like, oh, Lord. I start freaking out. Um, I got all my clothes because I had packed for 10 days, and so I dumped it all on the bed. I dumped my backpack, everything on the bed. I turned the room upside down. I can't find my laptop, and I'm freaking out. All right, I'm freaking out because I can't find it. I'm also freaking out because I'm going to have to tell my wife, honey, uh, we need to buy a new laptop. And, you know, that doesn't always go the right way, I guess, you know, spending all that money because I'm careless. And, uh, and uh, then I'm like, you know, I, I just need to pray. This is an attack from the enemy. I got spiritual, you know. And uh, I'm going to pray, and, and uh, God just gives me peace. There's men that are expecting me to go preach. And, and, and so I pray, and then I felt from the Lord telling me, like, hey, Mark, go take a shower. You know, relax, take a hot shower. And I'm like, that sounds great. So I'm in the shower. It's like a Garnier Fructis type of moment there in the shower. Don't try to picture it, please. And, uh, and as I'm in there, totally relaxed, my mind drifts away. And I see myself from Fort Lauderdale International Airport walking in. Um, and who's traveled recently on a plane? 
Is it me or is it do they make you take like all your clothes off before you get on a plane, right? And so I see myself taking my shoes off, my belt, my jacket, my cap. You know, I got to take the laptop out of the bag. And I see myself taking the laptop out of the bag, putting it in a tray all by itself. And then walking away to go through this like weird contraption CT looking machine that vroom, vroom, hands up. And I had just bought a coffee and I put the receipt in my back pocket, okay? And so... Um, I had something in my pocket that I didn't take out because I didn't feel it because I had to take all my clothes off and my belt and everything. And so they had to pat me down and then swab my hands and just in case I had a bomb or something and test it. And all the while, like 12 feet from me, I see all my stuff getting like bunched up with everyone else's stuff. And people are like going like this, like well, who's all this stuff? And finally I get there, I get dressed again and, and, and I walk away and I never got the laptop. And I panicked and I'm still in the shower. Shh. And then I'm freaking out. I got to get out of the shower, foreign shower. I try to turn it off. I turn it hot. I scorch myself. So I finally get out of the shower, and I'm freaking out, and I start calling everyone. Oh, my gosh. I lost my laptop. I can't believe it. Literally, I, I was about to cry. I mean, it was bad, a real bad. And one of the reasons why is I haven't backed up my laptop for like two years, um, which is don't do that. Okay, and it's just it takes so long to back up, but it's also worse when you lose videos and pictures and messages that you've written and all that stuff. And so I'm freaking out. I'm really upset. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I'm calling everyone. Can somebody please go find my laptop? And some of you are probably thinking, thinking este tipo está loco. This guy's crazy. All right. Um, but don't judge me. All right. Don't judge me. We've all had moments like this in our life. Right. All right. I, I've heard your stories, women, how you've lost your wedding rings. All right, people losing their sunglasses, leaving them at restaurants. All right, I remember when I was in high school, one of the big things that people would lose was their retainers, right? People would go, hey, look, someone just raised their hand. You're at lunch, and you're embarrassed, and so you wrap it up in a napkin, and then, you know, it's time to go because they give you, like, 15 minutes to eat in school, and so you throw away your retainer, and then you're, like, in last period, and you're, like, you know, it's when you get really bored in the last period, and you, like, play with your retainer. You know, people do, like, old people with their dentures. You know, that's a lot of fun. And you're like, no retainer, you know? And you're like, oh, my gosh, we've all done it, all right? And what's the first thing that happens when you lose something? You do whatever it takes to find it. You do whatever it takes to recover it. You call people, please help me. I lost something. I know when I lost my laptop, I started calling everybody in Miami. People wouldn't answer. People were busy. I call my wife, and I'm like, babe, can you please go to the airport and try to find my laptop? And she's like, babe, you left me here with three of your children. And on top of that, your mom asked me to watch your niece. And so I have four kids. There's no way that I can go with four little kids to the airport. I'm like, someone has to find my laptop. I lost it. See, people go through incredible lengths to find something that they've lost. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today in a message I've titled, The Lost Are Found. And why lost and found? Because the world was lost. The world was without hope, and God sent us Jesus. One of the biggest questions that people have when they study the life of Jesus is, why did Jesus have to come to earth? Why did God have to go through all the effort to come to live and to teach, to die, and to resurrect again? And Jesus sums up his entire ministry in one sentence. It's Luke 19. It says, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus came to do. Circle that word, the lost. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. And some people get offended by this term, the lost. You know what? I'm not lost. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. You know, and when people hear like the song Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. You know, or, or when someone says she's lost or, or he's lost and now they're found. Some people get offended by that term, but actually... That's not a demeaning term. It's actually a term of endearment. Lost implies value. If someone tells me I am lost, it means I'm worth finding. And so it's the first fill in your outline. Lost equals value. So when somebody uses the phrase, she's lost, he's lost, it means they have enormous value. You don't say, I misplaced my child. You, if you lose your kid, if you, mis, you, know, you can't find your kid at Target, you don't go to the front and tell the manager, I misplaced my child. You're know, like, I found my kid. Help me find my kid. And it's not like I've ever had to do that before. Um, you know, you misplace a pen. You misplace a comb. You misplace a bobby pin or a paper clip. But you don't misplace a diamond ring. You lose a diamond ring. Lost implies value, something that's worth finding. My laptop was lost. It was worth finding. Not only does it cost like hundreds of dollars, there's a bunch of things that I can't replace inside of it. So what does it mean to be spiritually lost? Because Jesus 
His purpose for coming to earth was to save that which was lost, to restore what was lost, to seek and to save, to find those that were lost. And, and that's why we're making such a big deal about encouraging everyone to invite their friends and their family to church on Easter. That's why when you got to church today, there was like two cards on your chair. People from the other services didn't leave it. I know you guys get here at one, like people leave a mess everywhere. There's like these two cards. No, we put those there so that you can invite someone to come to church with you on Easter. All right, that's why we have the, the table outside with the tickets. So after you can go and get tickets to one of our five services, all right? And, and the reason we make such a big deal about Easter is because statistics tell us, okay, it's the best day of the year to invite someone that doesn't go to church to come to church. Actually, eight out of ten people will say yes if you invite them to come. All right, and now we've given you five opportunities, five different services. So if you work on Saturday, you could come on Sunday. If you get out late, you could come at the 830 service. I mean, if you do brunch usually with your family, a lot of people do brunch on Easter, you could come the day before. You could come to the later services. And so we've created all these opportunities. Another thing that we've done on the back of your connection card, I made sure we put that there today. Um, we put three lines, all right? And that's because we want to pray for your friends and your family that don't know God, that are lost, that are far from God, that are struggling, that need the hope of Christ in their life. And so if you'd write down their names on the back of the connection card, I'll personally pray for them. All the pastors on the staff will pray for them. All Everyone that works here at the church that serves here, we're going to pray for them. And we're going to believe that when you invite them, they're going to come and they're going to find Christ. Amen? All right. On top of that, you're going to get an email from me this week, okay, with a link to a website that's going to give you tools to, like, post stuff uh, text them things, and a link where if you give us their name and their address, we will mail them a postcard. So think about this. We're praying. Jesus is going to soften their heart. You're going to invite them. Okay, there's five opportunities. And then on top of that, they're like, man, the craziest thing happened. I got a postcard in the mail inviting me to that Easter event that you told me about. All right? So we're going to team up, and we're going to believe that God's going to do it. Okay, because the whole purpose of this church is to seek and save that which is lost. See, if no one was lost, there'd be no reason to be here today. Our mission is Jesus' mission, to seek and save that which is lost. And so to be spiritually lost means to be disconnected from God. That's lost. To be lost means to be deceived by Satan. I don't see things correctly. I, I get gullible. I believe lies that aren't true. That's what being lost means. To be lost means to be detoured from the plan that God has for your life. God has a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. And he has a path for us to go on. But each of us, at one point or another in our life, have deviated. We've detoured off that path that God has for us. We've made dumb decisions. We've allowed people to influence us that have affected our decisions. We've all messed up. And you know what the Bible says in Romans 3.23? All have sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. In Isaiah 53, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own ways. So in other words, to summarize, summarize this, we've all done it. Each and every one of us, we've somehow gotten off the plan that God designed for us. You know, it also means to be disconnected from God, to be deceived. Okay, it means to be defeated by our own impulses. Sometimes we're defeated because of decisions that we make. We're defeated by our own habits, defeated by our sin. There's things in your life right now that you'd love to change, and you've tried time and time again. I want to change this about me, and you know why you can't change it? You know why it's so hard? Because willpower is not enough. We are lost, and we need God's power in our life. Okay, the effect of being spiritually lost, the Bible also tells us, is that we're disconnected, all right, from God. We become disconnected from God, and we lose out on a bunch of other things. Okay, we lose out on our freedom. We lose out on our dignity. We lose out on our confidence. We lose out on the potential that God has put inside of each and every one of us when we're not connected to God. And it could cause us to lose relationships. And many of us have lost relationships because we're disconnected from God. A lot of people become unhealthy. They lose their health because they're disconnected from God. They lose their happiness because they're disconnected from God. And what we're going to do today, we're going to look at the life of three people that Jesus helped restore what they have lost. The Bible teaches us that Jesus went to villages. He went to cities all over the area where he lived. And he went preaching, teaching, and healing. Those are the three things that Jesus did. He preached, he taught, and he healed people. So one-third of Jesus' ministry was healing people, was making people better. See, Jesus doesn't just care about your soul. He cares about your mind, and he cares about your body. 
And that's why as Christians, our mission is to do what Jesus did. It's to preach, to teach, and to bring people to the healing grace of Christ. To be healed physically. And a lot of people, man, they need healing internally in their hearts, in their minds, in their souls. People are broken. And that's why when you go to any country in the world, anywhere in the world, first school, first hospital, put there by Christians. It wasn't put there by a government. It was put there by Christians. It was the church that invented the hospital. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. He cares about us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Jesus cares about us. He wants us to have true health and true healing. All right, and speaking of, of being sick and wanting to be healed, for the last two weeks, everyone in my house has had the flu. Okay, everyone in my house has been sick, and I'm sick too. I'm sick and tired of paying hospital deductibles, okay? And then to make matters worse, on Wednesday, I'm trying to get out of bed, and uh, my alarm goes off, and I'm like stuck. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh my, whole, my body hurts. My neck is stiff. I have a sore throat. I have a headache. I think I have a fever. I'm sweating. What's happening to me? And I usually just take it like a man because Cuban men don't like going to the doctor, Right? And so I take a couple Advils, and I just try, I try to make it work, okay? Um, and I'm like, no, I, I have to preach on Sunday, and it's Wednesday, and so if I have what my kids have, and they've been sick for almost two weeks, I got to go somewhere and find out, right? And so I'm like, I'm going to go to urgent care. So I told my wife, and, and my kids are home because they're sick, and they're not allowed back in school yet. And, and uh, you know, so I say bye to my kids. I, I look terrible. And uh, I say bye to my daughter, and as I'm going to the door, whenever she's home, even if I've already said bye to her, she runs to the door. She's like, Bobby, 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 wait. And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking it's just going to be the typical kiss, and I miss you, I love you. And she says, Bobby, don't worry. Jesus is going to make you better, right? And, and that's awesome, and Stella was right. And that's the first filling in your outline. Jesus came to heal those who've lost their health. In Matthew 4, 23, it says that Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. That's incredible. That's what Jesus did. And there was this one man that Jesus heals. And, and we're going to, before we read about his story, I want to tell you that what Jesus does in his life, when we read it, we're going to be like, wow, Jesus healed this guy of a terrible disease. But what we really understand, when we understand the depth of what this guy is exper experiencing, we see how someone who's lost is now found. It's Mark 1. It says, a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cured. And if you stop there and give me your attention, I want to talk to you for a minute about what having leprosy in Jesus' day meant. See, in, in, in Jesus' time, this was a terminal disease. First it killed your soul, and then it killed your body. And, and the reason why I say killed your soul is because if you had leprosy, there was this stigma of an inward failure. People believed that anyone that had leprosy was experiencing the judgment of God. They had been committed to some type, they had committed some type of sin and God was punishing them. Okay, so this wasn't just something he caught. This is something given by God. That, that was the belief at that time. And so they were an outcast from society. Okay, they were considered unclean. They couldn't come into public places. The Bible teaches us that someone with leprosy, they had to wear ripped clothes. They had to have their hair all messed up. Okay, they need, needed to cover the bottom of their face so they wouldn't breathe on people. And on top of that, wherever they were, they had to yell, unclean, unclean, so that no one would come close to them. And so they're admitting, I'm a failure. I did some horrible thing, and I am experiencing the persecution of God. And of course, you know, there, there must have been this heartache inside of the person every time they, they were reminded, what did I do? And people were probably looking at him. You must be a horrible person. Look at you. You're falling apart because that's what would happen. The body would begin to deteriorate. Pieces of the body, limbs would fall off. And people were probably thinking, what kind of a failure is this guy? Can you imagine the humiliation that these people with leprosy went through? Okay, you weren't allowed to touch someone that had leprosy because if you touched them, now you became unclean. They could be stoned or whipped just for coming into public places, okay, because they would put other people at risk. Okay, so leprosy was like literally the walking dead. These people were, were a walking death sentence. 
okay? The Bible teaches us in the book of Leviticus that if you had leprosy, you had to be outside of the camp, outside of the city. And where was the church? In the city, in the camp. And so now to the person that had leprosy, they weren't even accepted by God. They couldn't go worship. They couldn't come to a place like this and draw closer to God. Can you imagine how this guy felt? That I am not welcomed in my city. I'm not welcomed by my family, by my friends, by the people I grew up with. I'm not welcomed by God. And check out what Jesus does in verse 41. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. Jesus did the unthinkable and he touched an untouchable man. When he did this, Two things could have happened. Either Jesus himself would have become unclean or this man was going to be healed. Those were the only two options. And as I look at this man's life, all I can do is think, how long has it been since anyone touched him? When was the last time someone wiped away his tears? When was the last time someone hugged him? When someone patted him on the back and said, hey, how are you doing? When was the last time someone gave him a gift or said they loved him? This guy was absolutely hopeless. He was a helpless man. And yet filled with compassion, the verse says, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing, be clean. Think about this. We have to think about this process. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. And then he said, I am willing. And here's the point. Jesus touched him before he spoke to him. We have to touch people before we speak to them. It's not enough to speak to the weak, to speak to the ill, to speak to the unclean. We have to reach out and touch them with the compassion of Christ. See, when Jesus touched him, he accepted him. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is saying, hey, no one's going to touch you. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to accept you. And then after he accepted him, he rejected the sickness. See, the other day, I was in the park with my kids, okay? My three kids, I have two boys. And if you, you see my kids, they're, they're rambunctious boys. They're full of life, nine and seven. And they have a little sister who's four who doesn't stay too far behind. And, and when they're together, they can get into trouble. All right, and like a good dad, okay, right? I play with them for a little while, and then I'm like, I need a break, and I took pictures, and I want to edit them so I can post them on social media and send them to the mom and, and say, hey, babe, I'm such a great dad. Check this out. The kids are having fun, right? So all the while, my kids are running around in this playground, and then I hear a woman yelling at my kids, like, oh, yeah, you know, and I, I look at her, and I say, oh, yeah, loca. I didn't say that. I wanted to say that, um, and so I walk over to her because it's so weird when you see someone that you don't know yelling at your kids. And so I walk over there, and I'm like, oh, do you, do you know my kids? Like, do they go to school with your kids? Because sometimes that happens. Like, people know your kids, but you don't know them, you know? And so especially, like, us, like, there's people here in the church that I've never really met, and I may not recognize them. I'm like, oh, this maybe it's one of their teachers from church or something, right? And so I'm like, do, do I know you? And she's like, no, 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 pero hey, that kid's going to kill himself. Look at him. You know, and my son Caleb likes to hang and do crazy things. And, and uh, I'm like, thank you. You know, I'll, I'll take care of it. But it was just really weird when someone that I didn't know was yelling at my kids. And here's the thing. No one cares how much you know until you show them how much you care. Okay? And Jesus touched the man before he spoke to him. And then he spoke to him and said, be clean. And years of sickness were gone in an instant. And years of loneliness were gone. And that man can finally go home. This wreck of a man, this ruin of a man could finally go home. Okay? And be united with his father. Be united with his wife. Be united with his children. Maybe meet grandchildren that he's never seen before. And there's a challenge in there for us. Okay? And the challenge is, who are the untouchable people in our world that we're not willing to touch in the name of Jesus, okay? Who are the people that we look at them and, and before we see who they are and we value who they are, what we see is what's happening on the outside and immediately we judged. See, when Jesus touched him, he accepted him. And after he accepted him, he was able to reject his illness. There are people in this world, okay? There's people that we know, people in our family, people in our community, okay? That, man, they're probably living life, and it's not the way that someone should live according to what we believe. But we can't expect people who aren't Christian to act like Christians. And so what we need to do before we start judging them and preaching to them is love them. Show them the compassion of Christ. Touch them. And after we touch them, we'll be able to reject the illness. We'll be able to speak into their life. And, and here's another challenge for us. Are we willing to pray for sick people and ask Jesus to heal them? And of course, yeah, of course. But no, are you really willing to do that? I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, I've been a pastor now, I think like 14 years. So it's been a long time. But there was a time when, you know, 14 years ago when I was like the new guy. 
at the church, and I was the youngest. They actually called me the kid, okay? And I missed that because I'm no longer the kid. I'm no, there's a bunch of younger guys now on, on our staff. And, and you know what happens when you're the kid? It means you go to every hospital visit. It means you do every funeral. It means that, like, you do all this stuff. And, and I remember going to pray for people and praying, you know, what I was taught to pray. God heal them, and God wouldn't heal them. And after a while, the older I got, I got a little jaded, and, and I would go pray, and then I would go, God, do your will. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, uh, help the doctor be a good doctor. Let the medicine work. And, and I just started losing my faith in that area, and I hated going to hospitals. I did. Um, and I'm confessing this before you. I'm sorry. I hated going to hospitals. And uh, one day, uh, about a year or two ago, um, I get a call on a Saturday. My family and I are getting ready to go to the beach. We got the kids ready. And it's a mission to go to the beach with three kids. You need life preservers and food and a bunch of stuff. The car's loaded up. I get a call from someone here at the office. And they're like, hey, someone called. And they want a pastor to go pray for them. I'm like, great. Call one of the other pastors. And they're like, uh, well, I did. I called this one. He's not answering. I'm like, oh. You know, he always never answers his phone. I called this one, and he's out of town. I called this one. He's part-time, and he's in his other job, and this one hasn't answered, and this one can't make it because he's doing something. And I'm like, are you kidding me? None of them can make it? Like, what is that? Call him again. And my wife is like, babe, what's going on? Is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, there's someone dying in the hospital, and no one's answering their phone. And she's like, uh, so why don't you go? I'm like, because we're going to the beach. I'm wearing my shorts, and there's stuff in the car. Where there's food in the car. She's like, honey, let's go pray for them, all right? I'm going to pray for you, <laughs> and, uh, and then we'll go to the beach after, and so we'll wait in the car, and so we drive to the hospital, and I, I'm with my Bible, and I'm just like, God, like, okay, so I'm here, so what am I going to pray? What are you going to do? The lady's dying, and, and I'm going to go in there, and, you know, and then all of a sudden, I felt God speak to me, and it wasn't audible, but it could have very well been. I felt God speak into my heart, into my soul, and God told me this. He said, it's your job to pray, and it's my job to heal. Go and do your job, okay? And I get, I, I've said this three times, and every time I tell this story, I get choked up because I heard God speak to me. I broke down in the middle of the hallway in uh, the Mir Miramar Regional or Mir uh, whatever the hospital is down the street from here, and, um, and I had to go to the waiting room and compose myself, and I was just going to do Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I was just going to do, go through the motions, okay, and... And God spoke to me, and from that day on, I went in there, and I did my job. It's not my job to heal someone. It's my job to have faith and pray and let God do his job. And I know some of you, I saw some people nodding uh, because we've all felt like that before. You know, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to let them down because what if God doesn't heal them? And you know what? It's not our problem. We don't need to defend God. God's going to do whatever it is he's going to do, and we just need to do our job, okay? And you know why God wants us to pray for people? Because he could heal them, and he also wants us to pray for people because it comforts them. It helps them feel love. It helps them know that they're not alone in this moment, okay? I, I prayed for two people uh, right after the second service that were having uh, problems with their son, okay? And the lady, she's broken because she's having problems with her son. And then when I was done praying, she was still crying, but now there was a smile on her face, okay? And I don't know what God's going to do with her son. But she knows that now someone loved her enough to stop and pray for her. Are you willing to pray for the sick? Are you willing to pray for those that need healing around you? God is calling us to do that. In James 5, it says this, Believing prayer will heal you, and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sin, you will be forgiven, healed inside and out. Amen. The second thing, Jesus came to liberate those who've lost their freedom. In Luke 4, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released and that the blind will see that the oppressed will be set free. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's like, I am your liberator. We have this beautiful illustration of Jesus freeing and setting someone free in the book of Luke. Okay? There's this guy that he's paralyzed. He's a para paralytic. He's on a, on a, he lives his whole life on this mat. Okay, and he has friends that love him, that care about him, that hear Jesus is in town. Okay, and if you've read the Bible, if you've heard stories about Jesus, wherever Jesus was, there was huge crowds. It was super hard to get close to Jesus when he was preaching. Okay, and now Jesus is in a house, and he's preaching in a house, and there's lines and people looking in through windows and openings in this house. And, and they're like, we know that if we can bring our friend in front of Jesus, Jesus will heal him. And these guys were determined. So they carry their friend on his mat all the way to the house, and they can't get in. They try every way to get in, and then they get on the roof 
of the house, all right? And so now they're on the roof of the house, and the Bible teaches us that they dig a hole through the roof of the house. Think about that, how much effort they had to go. And then they lay him in front of Jesus. So not only are they determined and they're great friends, they have great aim, okay? Because now the guy lands right in front of Jesus, all right? And check out what Jesus says. It says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched the man jump up, he picked up his mat and went home praising God. Jesus did two things here. Jesus liberated this man from his sins. He said, your sins are forgiven. And then Jesus went a step further and liberated this man from his limitations. He liberated him from his sin and liberated him from his limitations. And I'm going to give you a quick illustration of what's happening here and this, how it applies to our life. Okay, how many of you like going to the circus? All right, I hear that, you know, some, some of you are raising your hands because you're like animal activists and, and you're, you have your right to do that. But, you know, Cirque du Soleil is in town. So how many of you like Cirque du Soleil? Now we'll have more hands, all right? People love the circus. I love the circus. I like taking my kids to the circus. And, and my favorite thing are the trapeze artists. Okay, who likes the trapeze artist? I love that. It's crazy. One of the reasons I love the trapeze artist is because I was a trapeze artist. Here's a, a picture of me. <laughs> Why are you guys laughing? That's, that's back when, you know, I, I did a lot of curls back then. And so, and now that you're looking at the screen, here, here's a video of me in my earlier days as a trapeze artist. There I am. Check this out. This is incredible. That's me on the top there hanging backwards. Um. All right, all right. I have DVDs in the back for sale if you want to see the rest of my. And so here's, here's what we see here, all right? We see a trapeze artist. All right, they're on one deck, they're holding on to a rope, and now they go to the other side, and they're holding on to another rope. And there's something really interesting, see, that happens. For him to continue the performance and for someone else not to fall and break their neck, he has to let go of the other rope and now grab the other one, right? Grab, grab on the other rope. And there are times in our life that we know that God has liberated us, that God has freed us, and we hold on to that. And we're holding on to the freedom and the forgiveness of God. But there's other things in our life that are limiting us. And, 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 and we're holding on to, to grace and to freedom with this hand. All, everything that God's given us. And on the same time, in, in our other hand, we're holding on to guilt. We're holding on to shame. We're holding on to sin. We're holding on to bad habits. We're holding on to frustrations. We're holding on to pain. And, and while we're doing this whole thing, we're hanging in the air. And let me tell you, as a professional trapeze artist who's now retired, there's only so long that you can hold this stance. Okay, at one m point or another, you're going to either have to let go, you're going to fall and break your neck, or you're going to get stuck, or you're going to swing back where you once were. This stance isn't a stance that a trapeze artist can hold for too long. See, we weren't created to hold this stance forever, but Jesus was created. Our liberator was. You see, Jesus held on so that you and I can let go of all of the stuff that we used to be, of our past, of our sin, of our shame. And he's saying, hold on to my freedom. Hold on to my liberty. Hold on to everything that I want to give you. I want to set you free. And you've accepted me. You're trying to have a relationship with me, but you feel stuck. You feel like life is meaningless, like you're not going anywhere. And it's because with one hand, you're holding on to salvation. And with the other hand, you're holding on to other things that are keeping you stuck, that are keeping you paralyzed, that are keeping you captive. And what is paralyzing you? What's holding you back? What are those things? The third thing that Jesus came to do was to forgive those who've lost their dignity. Dignity, that's not even a word that we use that much nowadays. You know, and, and I Googled it, dignity, simple definition is the state or the quality of being worthy of honor or respect. See, human beings are like anything else, unlike anything else in creation, because we were given special dignity. You have more dignity than an ant, you have more dignity than a cow, than a bird. Why? Because God made you in his image. You 
have dignity because God decided to make you in his image. Nothing else in creation was created in God's image. And what does it mean to be created in God's image? It means you have the freedom to choose. You don't have the freedom. You know who doesn't have the freedom to choose? A dog doesn't have the freedom to choose. What Dogs go by their instincts. Snails don't have the freedom to choose. They just do snaily things. And by the way, snails are delicious. I had some snails the other day, and they were delicious. It, it was, they were cooked, you know, in some garlicky thing, and you kind of like pop them out, and they're gooey, but they're delicious, okay? You have the freedom to make choices, okay? You're never going to see a bird praying. You're never going to see a cow going to church. You're never going to see a worm worshiping God. But you were made in God's image, and that means that you have the ability to get to know God and be known by God. God gives you enormous dignity. Psalms 8 says this. It says, you, you crowned us with glory and honor. Each and every one of you have been crowned by God with glory and honor. He loves you. He created you, and he doesn't care about your past and your sin and your shame. God created you with great dignity, but here's a problem. Everything on earth is broken. Once sin entered the world, we all started making bad choices. Sin creates guilt. Sin creates regret. Sin creates shame. And, and you know what happens with guilt? You know what happens with regret? It robs you of your dignity, okay? And you stop feeling good about yourself when you feel guilty. You stop feeling good about yourself when you know that you've done something that's wrong, when you violated God's word, okay? And, and we stop wanting to go to church. We don't want to read our Bible. We don't even want to be close to God because we feel shame in our life. And that's the same thing that happened when Adam and Eve blew it, okay? God gave Adam and Eve free choice. He said, you can do whatever you want to do, okay, except this one thing, Okay, he didn't say there's 99 things you can't do. He said there's one thing that you can't do. He gave them the minimum temptation. And a lot of people have the question, I've had this question, why did God create temptation? Why didn't he just create this utopia, you could do whatever you want? You know, I think that, a lot of people think that. Why did God allow that? Because if you don't have a choice, it's not real love. Okay, you know what I tell my wife regularly? I say, honey, thank you for choosing me. Because she could have chosen anyone else. And I thank her. I'm like, babe, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for being my wife. Thank you for sleeping next to me. Thank you for choosing me. And because she has the choice to love me, I feel loved by her. It's not like we were the last two humans on a deserted island. And, you know, if we wanted, you know, civilization to continue, we had to, like, hook up. You know, no, there, there's no love in that. She's not my Wilson, you know. It's real love because she had a choice and I had a choice to love her. You can't say that you're good unless you've ever been tempted to be bad. You can't say that you're faithful unless you've ever been tempted to be unfaithful. So God said you can do anything you want in the planet, anything you want in the Garden of Eden, except that one thing. Don't do this. And what happened? It's human nature. It's like when you tell a kid, don't do this. What's going to happen? It's exactly what they're going to do. I mean... Uh, I was in California a couple days ago, and I saw a sign that I've never seen in my life. Don't pee on the wall. Don't urinate on the wall. I've never seen a sign like that in my life. Check out what else I saw. A giant pee stain on the wall, and, like, it dripped, and there was pee all over the sidewalk. I think if they would have put a sign, like, pee in this spot and, like, a red dot on the wall, there probably would have been no pee on the wall. But because they put don't pee on the wall, everybody, when no one was looking, I guess, peed on the wall. Okay. Um, and so it's like when you tell a kid, don't do this, and that's exactly what they do. And the reason I tell you is because I have three little kids, and I was painting the house, all right, before Christmas. And I'm like, guys, I'm painting the house. Don't touch the walls because they're wet. You're going to get wet. You're going to get dirty, all right, and you're going to, like, mess up my day. All right, do whatever you want. Play games, go to sleep, eat, draw, go outside. Just don't touch the wall. That's real easy, right? And then about an hour later, I hear my wife like, babe, I thought I told you not to wash things in the sink in the bathroom. And I'm like, I didn't. I've been using the hose outside. And she's like, well, then who did this? And so I walk over there. And as I'm walking over there, there's handprints all over the wall. And I'm like, little handprints. And I'm like, who did this? And guess who came out? My son Joshua comes out of his room, um, the middle child. Not that there's any stigma about being a middle child. And so he comes out, and, and he's like, papi, I'm sorry. I was just trying to be artistic like you. All right? And, and I'm like, didn't I tell you not to touch the walls? See, all of us do it. 
We do it. If there's one thing we can't do, that's what we do. Don't touch the pain, and that's what we do. And then we have regret, we have shame, and it robs us of our dignity. And that's why self-esteem is at an all-time low today in this world, all around the world, in people's lives. People don't feel good about themselves. They don't like themselves that much. And it's all because in the beginning, Adam and Eve blew it. In Genesis 3, it says this, at the moment of their sin, talking about Adam and Eve, their eyes were open, and then suddenly they they felt shame at their nakedness. They didn't feel shame before that. They felt shame then, and so they shrugged fig leaves together to cover themselves up. They are attempting a cover-up, the very first cover-up. When we feel regret, when we do something that's wrong, what do we do? We cover it up. What did Joshi do after he touched the wall? He went and hid somewhere in the house, all right? Hid from his father, just like Adam and Eve hid from their father. See, the Bible tells us of the story where Jesus comes face-to-face with a woman who's lost her dignity. All right, Jesus is hanging out, and these religious freaks come to him, the Pharisees, and they're like, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. I thought this, especially when I was a teenager. How do you catch someone in the act of adultery? All right? First of all, you're a peeping Tom. Okay? You guys know what adultery is. We're all adults here. We know what's happening. Okay? This woman's in it. And so they bring her. The other question is, she must have been adultering. I don't know if that's a word. With another person. You can't adulter by yourself. Okay? I'm like, where's the guy? So they bring her before Jesus, and they start quoting scripture to God, okay? And they're saying, shouldn't we do this and that? And doesn't it say that that we should stone her, and she's guilty of death? And as they're talking to him, Jesus started doing what some of you are probably doing now. He starts doodling on the sand. Now, is there any doodlers here? All right, I just saw you. Stick up your head. He's doodling right there, just admitting. I doodle all the time, all right? And so, people, there's debates by all these scholars, all these stiffs, like, oh, Jesus started writing scripture, On the sand. No, I think that as these guys were mumbling to the guy that wrote the book, he's doodling on the sand and they're looking at him like, why is he doing this? All right. And then when they're done saying she's worthy of death, he says, All right, it's right. He that has no sin casts the first stone. And then the Bible says that he goes back to the sand. He liked playing with sand. My kids like playing with sand. And so Jesus is now on the sand. And I believe that now he starts to write. And we don't know what he wrote, but this is what I think. I think he started writing the sins of the people that were in the crowd, the sins of the people that were holding those stones. And the reason I believe that, because the Bible says that one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they started dropping their, their stones, and they started walking away. And check out what Luke 8 says. It says, then Jesus stood up from writing in the sand, and he said, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. When I I read that for the first time, I'm like, that's it? That's all that he's going to say? I mean, I I could at least have an eight-point sermon on adultery. This is the reason why what you did is bad, okay? But he didn't tell her that, all right? And you know what I've discovered is that you don't need to make people feel guilty. They already do. That's one of the reasons why people are afraid to come to church Because they think, why do I want to go to a place where they're going to tell me everything that I'm doing that's wrong? You know, if I had like 15 traffic tickets, and I don't, I just have one I need to pay next month. And and I get up on Sunday morning, and I say to my wife, okay, I have 15 traffic tickets. I'm guilty. Why don't we go to the courthouse so that the judge can tell me that I'm a bad driver? All right? Nobody does that. We don't do that here at Calvary. Okay? That's not the Jesus model. You know what the Jesus model is? That we defend people's dignity no matter how bad their sin is. We defend their dignity in public and then we deal with their sin in private. Does that make sense? Are you happy to be in a place that that's what we do? This is our mission, all right? You don't change people by holding up a poster and protesting. That doesn't work. Does nagging work for you? I hate to be nagged, okay? Nagging doesn't work for me and nagging doesn't work for anyone. It doesn't work in church. It doesn't work anywhere else. And so Jesus, he defends her dignity. And then in privacy, one-on-one, he has a conversation with her. He says, you know better than that. Not only do you know better than that, you are better than that. He shows her forgiveness. And Jesus shows forgiveness to those who've lost their dignity. I don't know what your secret shame is, but you do. And it's probably coming to your mind right now as I'm saying that secret shame, that sin, that habit. And you're thinking about it right now. And you know what? You know what the Bible has to say about that? 
Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus came to fix you. Jesus came to rescue you. Jesus came to set you free. And you're listening to this now and you believe it because for some reason you're here and it's because God has to have something better than what I'm dealing with now in my life. And you're holding on to that. You're holding on to God's forgiveness. But the problem is that you feel stuck. You feel like I'm not going anywhere because you're holding on to all that other stuff. You're still holding on to the pain, to the scars, to what someone said to you. You're holding on to the shame. You're holding on to that sin, to that secret thing that you do. Maybe it's something that gives you pleasure. It's something that, man, no one knows about. It's not hurting anyone, but it's hurting you, and it's hurting you from going where God wants to lead you. God has an incredible plan for each and every one of us in this room. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life that's bigger? The Bible says that anything you could ever imagine, anything that you could think about falls so short of what God wants to do in your life, and yet you're never going to get there if you're like that trapeze artist who's holding on to God and ho is holding on to all that other junk at one point or another you're gonna die you're gonna kill your relationships you're gonna kill everyone around you destroy people's hearts destroy people's lives ruin your children's lives ruin your future if you keep holding on to those two things it is not possible you have to let go and Jesus held on that cross so that we can let go and enjoy the life and the purpose that he has for each and every one of us Jesus came to heal those who've lost their health Jesus came to liberate those who've lost their freedom and Jesus came to forgive those who've lost their dignity. And I'm going to invite you to stand up and I ask George to sing a song and we're going to worship God. But what, the other thing that we're going to do is that we're going to believe that if there's someone here today that needs to say, God, you know what, I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to stop trying to control this madness in my life and I'm going to offer it 100% to you. There's people here that have never trusted God with their life, the most important thing that you have. There's Christians here who have been living that dual life. You know, when you let go of God sometimes and, and you swing back to the other side and, and you're hanging out there and doing the things that you used to do, doing things that you know that are killing you and are hurting the people around you and are robbing you from the blessings of God in your life and you're hanging on that thing and then every once in a while, boom, you come back and you hold on but you've never experienced what it means to be in the perfect will of God, living for God 100% and you've never let go and I believe that today if you decide to let go, you will begin to experience that life and I want to pray for you if you're here today so when the band sings I invite you to come forward and there's another thing that I believe God's gonna do okay I told you my story about how I lost my laptop and some of you are still remembering man poor guy he lost his laptop I called people some people were tired some people couldn't go my wife was with four kids and, and then I called George and I told George about what, what was going on and, and George is like all right I'll go to the airport on Saturday he gets to the airport airport lost and found closed of course government agency why should they be open right close and then my wife said babe promise me this isn't going to ruin our weekend I'm like sure but it's ruining my my mind it's I'm obsessing about this about all the implications and then on Monday morning we're getting ready to get the reason I put us on those bikes we're, we're on those bikes it's early in the morning okay we're riding to Venice Beach and I get a text from George he's like hey I'm going to go to the airport to find your laptop and then I'm like awesome and then like two hours later, George sends me a picture of his giant hands holding my laptop. All right? What was lost was found. And sometimes we need someone to go find us. Sometimes God is calling you to go and find and help someone else who needs healing, someone else who needs to be set free, someone else who's lost their dignity. And that's why I told you on the back of your connection card, write down those names. So if you're here today and you wrote down names, I want you to put them here on the altar today. We're going to pray and we're going to believe that God is going to do a work in their lives too so you can be someone else's George. When I was on the West Coast, George on the East Coast went and found my laptop, which I had lost. And now as I preach this, I'm like, God, this is all your fault. I lost my laptop. George found it because you wanted me to have this illustration about how we're not meant to do life on our own. All right, some of you came with someone today. 
all right? And your job is to be George for them and say, hey, you know what? Let's go up together. Let's believe that you're going to be set free. Let's believe that we're going to be happy. Let's believe that we're going to get on the right track together and follow God and do what's right and live the blessings of God. We're going to try this together. And so as he sings, you're giving your life to Christ, come up. You need God to heal you because you're sick, come up. You know people that need Jesus, come up. We're going to pray. We're going to believe, and God will do it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can do it? And so as they pray, the people come up, and, and we're going to hang out here and believe, all right? So let's sing, let's worship, and let's come up and watch God work. Amen? Come on. We hope you enjoyed the message. If today you want to take your next step with God and give your life to Christ, please visit mycalvary.com forward slash begin. We have a free gift for you. We also want to encourage you to share today's message with all your friends and family and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. From all of us at Calvary, God bless.